Hello. You know how everyone on a project can just turn up at their desks and do their work and make tangible, substantial progress for eight hours a day and the day after that and the day after that because they can readily find answers to all of their questions in the documentation? No, I don't think you do because projects, they don't work perfectly like that. Hi, I'm Liani, pronouns she, her, and I'm a product manager at Ad Hoc, a federal digital services consultancy. In these next few minutes, you'll also be hearing from my colleagues Gretchen Michalak, she, her, and Michael Challen, he, him. I have to mention our final colleague, Amy Goldman, a writing and content strategist at The Sew Company. Amy was unable to join us today, but we couldn't have done this work over the past year, year and a half without her. We also want to take a moment to thank our partners at Ad Hoc, The Sew Company, and our prime contractor, Oddball, whose support and teamwork helped us get to where we are today. Ad hoc, Oddball, and the Sew Company provide the VA with product management, engineering, and writing people power. And today, what we actually want to talk about, now that I've gotten all of those accolades and credits out of the way, is crowdsourcing documentation. Here's our agenda. First, we'll go over how we found ourselves needing to manage up and across, or in other words, act out of our league to create some sort, any sort of content ecosystem. I know this conference is about writing best practices and what you can take back to your own environments. So we'll try to keep this story as abstracted as possible. We're gonna add some details about the VA and the complexity that we are dealing with, but you don't have to remember them nitty gritty and specifically because we wanna, again, keep this talk as general as possible. Hopefully those details help give a sense of the complications we were navigating. Second, we'll talk about how we went from a haphazard, yeah, haphazard is the right word, haphazard content ecosystem to a serviceable one, an all right one. I'm using the word haphazard very intentionally because we know that having no content strategy is itself a content strategy and a bad one at that. Finally, we'll share how we're thinking about going from an all right, a serviceable content ecosystem to a good one. That chapter, we're still writing it. Hi, I'm Mike Chellen. I'm the lead for the VA.gov platform team within the office of the CTO. Within the VA.gov platform team, there is a content team, which is tasked with maintaining, coordinating, all of the platform team's documentation. Now, when we say the platform team, that's actually over 100 people with 10 or more different teams and many different products and services. This includes both the underlying technical infrastructure and services required to operate VA.gov and additional standards, guidelines, and shared tooling for all the different teams that are building on top of VA.gov. That means there's quite a lot of documentation. There's a lot of different information that needs to be navigated to effectively build on uh, the platform services. These platform teams have generated that documentation and try to keep it updated as best as possible. However, given the number of teams that we have and given the number of different users and the different types of users, it can be difficult to maintain all of that documentation, keep it updated, make sure that it's uh, high quality, make sure that it is easy to find. And that's the challenge that the content team was tasked with addressing. How do we maintain high quality documentation that is easily discoverable, that answers all the different types of questions our users have, and do that in a way that is efficient across our 10 plus 
platform teams and that works well for the 30 or 40 application teams that are building on the VA DACA platform. So Mike Challen explained the environments that we were working in. There are admittedly a lot of names. There's VA.gov, platform, VA.gov platform, teams, subteams. You might not remember the specifics of each name and what it means, but all of that is to say that our three documentarians, the three people working on the content team were in a very complex environment with a lot of moving parts. So the question is, how do three single people make docs that 100 people created? How do they make those docs organized, well-maintained, useful, high quality, and findable? And how do those same three people make sure to do that work, making good docs, in any sort of long-lasting, enduring way? What we did was we treated content like a product. And that meant moving in an agile fashion, building, testing, and learning in swift, steady iterations. Because the goal is to make a docs hub that's a trusted source of truth for customers to learn about the team's products. I know just now I said steadily and swift. I'm admittedly biased because, of course, I think the work that we did was incredible. But I also want to be straight with any of you public sector people, or rather private sector people out there, our definition as public sector workers of steady and swift is going to look different in your all settings. Anyway, that's the part that's crossed out on the slides. That was our stated goal. And if we were going to do something that was long lasting and sustainable, and sustainable not just for the work, but very honestly, sustainable for ourselves as humans and documentarians, we had to have underlying, frankly, unstated goals. And those unstated goals were, one, create a culture that collectively prioritizes documentation, collectively, and two, empower technologists to proactively author contents. Here are some ways that we did that. Hi, I'm Gretchen Metellic. As the senior writer on the team, my role was to drive the content strategy in support of our goals. One aspect of our strategy was to guide everyone to write well and consistently, regardless of whether or not they had the word writer in their job title. When you're a tiny documentation team, helping to produce a lot of documentation quickly, everyone becomes a writer. Your team can't keep their eyes on everything, let alone write about everything. As Liani mentioned, we were one of over 10 teams. Together, these teams published over 300 documents on a tight timeline. It wasn't realistic for us as writers to be heavily involved in every document. Time and subject matter expertise were precious and scarce. You might be in a similar situation. To guide our writers, we saw ourselves as guardrails, not gatekeepers. There are some examples on this slide of various processes and standards you can produce as part of your strategy. I could say a lot about each of these bullets. Everyone is an important aspect of a content strategy. But if you find yourself guiding a lot of people who don't normally write documentation, don't panic when they don't follow all the rules right away. At first, it's more important to have your guidance documented than it is for all of it to be followed to a T. You're laying a foundation to drive consistency and quality over time. When people reach out to you for writing support, you can use your documented guidance to frame your feedback. For example, you can say, per our guidelines, please use a numbered list for this series of steps instead of a bulleted list with a link to your style guide. Eventually, people will start using the style guide, and if they don't, you can experiment with other ways to drive adoption. Documenting your guidelines and processes also allows you to watch for where people tend to break the rules. You might want to provide additional training or do some research to understand why there's a padding pattern of breaking rules in certain ways. Maybe your instructions are unclear or your process is too complicated. You can hone in on problem areas that need improvement. Now, this is not to say that you should completely ignore the quality of your documentation. 
but do choose where to invest your time and skills carefully. Prioritize your efforts on concerns that significantly impact the user experience and take a longer term approach for the rest. The second aspect of our strategy was to make the thing serviceable. And by serviceable, we mean a body of documentation that works reasonably well for users, even if it's not perfect. Serviceable isn't your long-term goal. So when your documentarians are busy writing and publishing docs, you can set up listeners to monitor your docs. For example, give users a way to provide feedback on every documentation page and develop processes to respond to that feedback. Set up analytics to monitor your documentation usage. Monitor customer support requests. Consider connecting with your customer support team to create a feedback loop between your teams. You can have a mutually beneficial relationship where they help you understand where to improve your docs and you in turn reduce the number of support requests with your fantastic documentation. Conduct research to evaluate the usability and findability of your docs. Your technologists turned documentarians are involved in the daily grind of writing docs. And as a strategist, looking out across the whole set of documentation, you're positioned to take a 10,000 foot view. You can do research with your users to assess the overall usability of your documentation and understand where to prioritize your efforts. This is particularly helpful for topics that may cut across multiple teams or products. So if team A, B, and C all have content related to a specific topic, you might find yourself with redundant documentation or fragmented bits of information in your documentation. User research can help you understand your users' mental models, their expectations for how and where to find information on a specific topic. And then you can present your findings back to team A, B, and C and guide them to uh, future improvements of their documentation. And finally, be comfortable with imperfect documentation. Be patient. It is uncomfortable to be a guardrail when you know you could have a bigger impact on individual document quality as a gatekeeper, but you can't be everywhere at once. Let things unfold, monitor from behind the scenes to identify improvements that could be made, consider ways to update and improve your guidance and training before trying to jump in and fix things yourself. And don't forget to celebrate the small victories. So maybe your set of documentation is just all right, but you've laid a good foundation. Your users can find things, find information that they couldn't find before, they can provide feedback on it, and you can monitor how it's being used. Our third strategy was to tell customers about it. So let's look at this picture here. If your marketing group is the only one holding the microphone, then quite honestly, they will be able to market better than we, documentarians turned marketers, were able to. But in our case, the whole team, all 100 of us, were playing hot potato with the microphone. So that meant that the whole VA.gov platform team all had to buy into the documentation. That boils down to, Everybody talks about the documentation and everybody refers to it with the same name. Old documentation is deprecated and it redirects to the new documentation. And that's how we accomplished the two goals. We got something that was approximately house shaped, not just an artfully arranged pile of lumber, or in our case, a docs hub that was called a platform website not simply a jumble of words. Crowdsourcing your documentation will mean that lots of docs are written. Yay. But that means that a lot of many things unknown are being written. And to continue this stretching this house analogy, how do you get from the first picture to the second more glamorous, very flashy picture? We're currently balancing editorial oversight with publishing speed. At this point, our technologists turned documentarians are used to moving fast and publishing. And by at this point, I mean now in the past like three to four to five months. We want to maintain their autonomy and empowerment as we, as a group of 10 product development teams, move from an all right, 
okay, serviceable content ecosystem to a good solid one. I said at the very, very, very top that this chapter is still being written. And it is. Like I said, we're in the middle. We're five months in. We're trying things. We're learning. We're iterating. And our current strategy is to give technologists turned documentarians the tools that they can use to easily empower themselves to write more solid content. Here's a bit about how we're thinking of this. One tactic is we want to develop better writers. <laughs> Our crowdsourced documentation is written primarily by technologists, not writers, technologists. So one, what we're doing is incorporating a linter. The linter allows our individual authors to self-serve. They can write with more consistency in content delivery, terminology, voice, tone, and grammar because the linter that we've added automatically checks against the style guide. As Gretchen mentioned, the style guide is the rule of the road, the rule of the rules rather of the content ecosystem. And automatically checking, it comes in the step of me as an individual author, I have an idea, I want to write it. And before I publish it, the linter kicks in and says, oh, have you considered revising X, Y, and Z things? And as the author, I can then choose to revise them or not. Also, introducing an intake process. So the journey currently in a democratized world, the journey from an idea to a published doc does not include the content team. The intake process allows authors to rope in the content team if they want extra supports. And that extra support could be reviewing against a style guide because the linter is, is not working for whatever reason or not cutting the mustard. They maybe want more advice, more white glove advice around content strategy. The idea is a way to engage the content team in a way that doesn't overwhelm the content team and doesn't overwhelm me as an author. Increasing the use of templates. So we had been following or have rather been following a diatax diataxis, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, a diataxis framework. So a way of conveying technical content in a clear, concise way. Gretchen actually learned about this framework from last year's Write the Docs conference. And right now we have a how-to template. So how to perform a task. And that's a template of an overview with individual steps and procedures. We also have an overview template, something that gives readers the context. We're considering adding more templates, but what is important here is having some way of standardizing your way of conveying information so that individual authors can follow and they don't have to think too hard about you know, what the user finds important or not. We want to clarify the ownership and maintenance responsibilities of a specific document. So as you might well know, being on the hook for a document isn't the same as tending it, looking after it from day to day. Distinguishing between a doc's owner and its maintainer makes it clear for an individual to know who to contact and how to add to that document when that individual has content ideas. Finally, we're embedding writers within product teams. So we started with three documentarians and out of bandwidth necessity, had to act as guardrails, not gatekeepers. Our team is larger now. We, are writing, we have a writing team of six, a mix of UX writers, a mix of content strategists, and a mix of technical writers. And so we're able to send this mix of people out to Scrum with individual product development teams so that they can focus on a very particular set of documentation. At the same time, because we have spent the hard work and the months and the years of inculcating this culture of documentation across everybody and this hundred plus people, technologists know how hard it is to write, to write well. And so they welcome the embedded writers as extra resources and as extra personnel to be able to provide that quality. 
So the first tactic and strategy was to develop better writers. Our other tactic is to help technologists prioritize what to write. We want to regularly publish document health metrics in order to help people understand how well their documents are performing. This is actually twofold. First, in a democratized, a truly democratized system, anything, and anything within reason, but anything could be written. But there's nothing or no one that steps a bit above the fray and says, oh wow, a thousand things have been written. Here's how your thousand things have performed over the past six months, or the past three months. 30 of those thousand things are highly trafficked, 20 fo follow templates or 20 don't follow templates and really should. Uh, and 10, I don't know, whatever you have, there's no like, there's no meta analysis of the thousand things that have been written in a previous period of time. That's the first part, giving writers the tools to analyze what they have written in the recent past. The second part is, Maybe there are a thousand things to write. So there is today and tomorrow. We have things coming down the pike. How do we prioritize? So of these thousand things to write, there are 10 most important points to hit. And that is governed by, I don't know, qualitative and quantitative user feedback, product evolution, a new release. Again, there's nothing meta that steps above the fray. So there's in publishing documentation health metrics, there's something that's, there's a retroactive piece and there's a proactive piece. Again, like I said at the beginning of the section, we're thinking about this. We're trying to figure out our, our magic sauce formula and that chapter is still being written. Cool. I wanna end this presentation with our three documentarians from the start. Over the past year and a half, we've gone from a haphazard collection of docs to an all right content ecosystem. And now we're going from all right to hopefully good. This could be you. You could be a blue person in this picture. If you're in this position right now, we hope that any or all of what we shared has been helpful. Good luck. If you want to contact us, here's our information. We'll also be around for Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess we can get started. I wanted to thank all of you for coming in. And I thought it was a really cool theme to end on for um, this block of talks and for the second day and for the conference in general, because um, for both of your talks, you're talking about how to get people to work together, playing to their strengths. You know, um, a lot of the time a company will face this problem and will go, oh, do we need to, do we need like a fancy new tool? Do we need to hire new people? And sometimes the answers are the people who are already working with us and around us and already like kind of enmeshed in our worlds already. So I think it was really cool rather than, you know, chasing big fancy solutions to kind of look in and see how we can um, make our own processes better and more collaborative. So I thought that was really fun. Um, and yeah, I think it's a nice takeaway for the end of the second day. So yeah, I've got uh, some questions that I can launch into. You can let me know if there are any that you saw in the chats that you thought were really, you know, you really wanted to sink your teeth into. Um, one question that I got for Leanne and Gretchen is how do you maintain a single source of truth when you have a lot of technologists working on the same thing? Somebody's got to unmute. <laughs> I can take that one, Leanne. Um, uh, when we started, the bar was really, really, really low. Like there was information like in nooks and crannies all over the internet of GitHub and Google Docs and part of the normal things that you would do in an audit to root out some of that stuff, we didn't really have the, we weren't able to do. So just bringing everything under run roof, like into one site, it was a, um, the tooling, we didn't get into the tooling, but it, we used Confluence plus, uh, Confluence Cloud plus Scroll Viewport. Um, shout out to the Scroll Viewport people. I saw some names I recognized. It worked out really well for us. Um, 
but just getting it all under one roof, like, and publishing things, it's a little painful, but like, oh, look, there's three documents about the same thing. What should we do about that? Like, is kind of the forcing mechanism that needs to happen in order to get attention on it. Um, and it's not like maybe ideal or the best way to approach it, but you know, when you push it out there and publish it and see that like there's conflicting information or duplicative information and it's published, um, that's a good way to shine a spotlight on um, when the documentation is not the single source of truth, um, but driving everybody to the new um, set of information and making it a better experience than what there was there before was um, part of our solution for them. Yeah, and to add on to what Gretchen was saying, I guess I see two parts of single source of truth. There's how is this particular piece of doc, this hub of documentation, the thing to hold canon? And that's like one aspect of source of truth. And then within that, like, oh, there are many parts within the documentation hub, which is part A, like is more valid than part B, who knows? Because they're all, the, the customer doesn't know. And so for part A, um, that relates, part A being, um, why is this particular documentation hub held more highly in regard? That was the, everybody talks about it. It's just a reinforced message that all of the hundred other people in our program just hammered <laughs> to our customers day in and day out. Um, and that was in various ways, overtly, we would say, and then go to the documentation hub and then covertly of saying, oh, I see you need information about X, Y, Z. Here is a link. And it just so happens to be the documentation of. And then for the other parts um, of like, why is, is um, there's a documentation hub and maybe page A and page B are conflicting. What is, what is true? I think that actually links to another question that I saw in chat, which was like, how do we add documentation, writing and editing to the product development timeline? And the answer right now, and Gretchen is grinning, is we don't. We kind of just hope, but it's one of those next steps of something that we're trying, which is um, creating that meta view so other teams can see, oh, this is what's wrong. Oh, maybe there is conflicts that we should fix. Uh, it's not something that we've done, but it is an initiative for right now. And so by um, melding into the product development timeline, that allows more visibility and what we call it, Gretchen, we can use our, our Rachel hammer, our, our clients. Um, so we have our clients being able to say, oh, well, since we're a product led environment, um, truly there should not be conflicts in your roadmap, that sort of thing. Cool. And maybe a follow-up question um, about resourcing is the question from Dylan in the chat. Did you have trouble getting technologists to actively participate in creating docs due to their other priorities? Like, how do you get time allocated for them uh, to work on the docs specifically? Can you? Have you? <laughs> we all want to know. Do you want to take this one? <laughs> sure. Um, well, we were fortunate in our scenario that we had a lot of like we had like top down support with us like it was made an initiative at the, the top level of our program that like hey we're moving everything over to this new documentation site and it was mandated that every team work into their roadmap for the year for 2021 you need to move your docs from wherever they are over to this new experience clean them up if you um please <laughs> if, but if you have time um add new stuff um but it was, so having that top level support, so if you don't have that, trying to figure out how to get that is a really um, effective lever to pull to get um, support for um, getting people to create docs. But um, not everybody had a lot of time to um, clean up things as they move them over. And so then that was kind of the behind the scenes work of doing some research on what was there and setting in, up instrumentation for feedback and analytics so that like after every, as everybody was moving their information and after they did we were able to um synthesize kind of triangulate the data points and then go back to leadership and um like get ahead of planning to say hey you know this is a priority area we think maybe we should work with this 
team on their docs and then aligning resources kind of on like a, you know, whatever your cadence is for um, planning throughout the year and kind of getting ahead of it that way. Great, thank you. I've got some questions for Aaron. I think just the API world and writers involvement in it really struck a chord with people. So we've got a couple questions about um, API government, sorry, governance guidelines. Um, does your team set them? Um, if so, how do you coordinate with product delivery to enforce those guidelines? And how can writers contribute to API governance guidelines? So big questions. Right, so starting with involving tech writers early, um, a lot of this gets to that RFC process that I was talking about where um, when we get an idea for something we feel like should be a feature, like we get the ball rolling with an internal facing document and get the, doc get the tech writers involved as soon as possible. They're excellent at spotting features that are not going to be simple and easy to use and easy to explain uh, to customers. And uh, that's one thing I love about our documentation specialist is the way she leads in uh, to those discussions and helps us set the tone right. Often as we're designing a feature, we don't know what's the best approach and we'll outright say, here's a few different possibilities for this endpoint. What do you think? We'll tag her in and see what she has to say. So uh, my team does have a lot of leeway to set our process there. And we've, we've just made that our process. We, we've said, this is the way we wanna do things. And that also gets back to, including her in par as part of the team uh, means that you know, she gets to help define the process. I think there was another question there about enforcement. Um, we honestly haven't run into that a whole lot. We don't have a lot of people bypassing RFCs. It's also a way that engineers get recognized for building features and getting consensus on what makes for a good feature. So it's um, it helps our engineers as well. Yeah, that's great, um, thanks. Were there more questions yeah. in there? I, I know there was a few there were a few different facets to this oh okay. i just kind of threw them at you so <laughs> it's a great answer though thank you um that we had another question um you gave us such a great case study in the insurance world and jen was wondering how could you abstract the value of the the docs the, the writers or documentarian contributions to the code of the api product um in other industries do you have any thoughts on what that could look like um Yes, I feel like some of these things aren't super duper uh, in industry specific. Mm -hmm. And certainly um, the other companies I've worked at have been in very different industries. So a lot of things I feel are, if not universal, at least broadly applicable. Mm -hmm. And uh, what one thing that gives me hope about that is an answer that Liani and Gretchen gave a minute ago about seeing people recognized and making sure they, they get recognized for collaboration and it's part of the reward structure. And um, I loved hearing that because that, that that gives me hope that, um, that this, this sort of, these sorts of practices apply in lots of industries. Um, also, while I'm talking about your talk, I loved the way that you talked about using metrics to support the people making the documentation. Um, here's where you've made good use of templates. Um, here's where this could have been better. Um, and like not as a cudgel from management, but as a support tool for the people doing the work. That's so nice. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so, so nice to think about more like the carrot rather than the stick. I think sometimes we need to do that. Um, we got a question that I think could apply to everybody. So maybe I'll start with Leonie and Gretchen, and then get back to you, Erin. It's, uh, you know, one of those general que questions of where do you go from here? How do you take the ideas that you all talked about today and then use it for future growth? And what would you like to do um, with those ideas in the future? Oh, pet break. We need more pet breaks. I'll pass it on to the rest of the organizers. <laughs> Leanne and Gretchen, um, does one of you want to take a stab at it? Doesn't need to be perfect. You got great thinking faces so far. Yeah. So it was, I know we were practicing. <laughs> so <laughs> the question was, we've learned stuff. Are we going yeah, to what's do next? anything we're, we're, with the stuff yeah. that we've learned, basically? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the past, so this work that Gretchen, myself, and Amy that I shouted out at the beginning of the talk, it all came together in like a year, two years, a year and a half. Yeah. And I think what the biggest accomplishment that we've 
the we use the word consulting a lot in our field. The biggest bit of consulting that we've able been able to do is yes, we can treat content as a product and it can work if you squint. Um, and you just kind of make my things like adjust things, but also uh, we've impressed upon the clients that not all writers are the same. So not all a tech writer, tech writer A versus tech writer B, not the same, let alone tech writer, tech writers versus UX writers versus content strategists, also not the same. Uh, I would say those are the two biggest um, frictions that we faced and, and going forward, I'm optimistic that that our clients will be behind that when we make recommendations for staffing changes or whatnot they'll be like oh yeah, yeah yeah we we buy in we understand where you're coming from great gretchen do you have anything to add or do you want to move on to aaron um i'd love to see for the um the balance of um I don't know specifically if it's like the publishing speed versus the editorial rigor, like kind of shift a little bit, you know, see how much we can do without feeling, making people feel like they're having to compromise their speed, but also improves a, like rigor wise, whether and like if it's um, increasing adoption of the templates and finding kind of behind the scenes creative ways to get people to write better um, um, from the get go um, and whatever that looks like, whatever the, the solutions shake out to be um, without making people feel like we're too much up in their business and mm -hmm. slowing them down. But if we do have to slow things down a little bit, that it feels like the right time. And it feels, you know, that everybody's, um, that we're not just like dropping the editorial hammer um, out of nowhere, <laughs> on them, that it's kind of a gradual process towards that. Yeah, great. Thank you, Aaron and Jolene, what do you think? Oh. She's growling because my son has a friend over. Oh no. <laughs> She's like, I just got here, but I've already learned there's infinite peanut butter and I want to protect that. I would too. I'm allergic to peanut butter and I still would. <laughs> you know when I've gotten a good thing. <laughs> yeah, Aiden, I thought the same thing. We we thought that she was just being shy. <laughs> Uh, sorry, was there another question for me? Yeah, just uh, the same one. Just uh, where do you go from here? How do you um, want to take the lessons that you were talking about in your talk and then bring it to like future growth? For sure. Uh, one of them, because we're a fairly new company, is we don't have a lot of structures in place for the kind of like tangible rewards. Um, I, I'd love to see us have some spot awards that people could nominate each other for. And so that's, I'll be pursuing that with our director at some point. And let's see, other stuff, I'd, I'd love to see us have more writers because we've, we've got, I, I think when you, as, as you all know, when you have more than one person, the, the, the power of collaboration uh, multiplies rather than adds. So I, I, I would love to have us um, staff an additional writer position, especially as we look at other engineering product, projects that we've got on the roadmap. Great. Well, I wanted to thank you. We're at time and there are always questions that we can't get to, but I think uh, in the chat, Sherry really made a great point. Um, I appreciate how all the speakers are so candid about the hard stuff and acknowledge they're not where they want to be yet. I think that makes us all feel better. You know, it's one thing when you have a talk and they're like, I've done it and it's perfect now and it will always be perfect. And nobody can ever relate to that kind of talk. You always kind of side eye it because you're like, does this situation never really exist? So when you talk honestly about the challenges that you've run into, the ongoing work that you've um, put into solving them and the lessons that you've learned, like I think that's the most actionable stuff and that's what I think people really connect with. So I wanted to thank the three of you um, and your colleagues who helped but can't be here. I think uh, it's made such a difference and I'm sure people are gonna go back to these talks and just appreciate that they exist and that those ideas are out there for us to engage with. So thank you again.